Hello. I wanted to send a brief message to uh, thank everyone who has supported my short story channel and my uh, Got Away With Murder channel over the past year. I've been imme immensely grateful for the um, help, advice, support uh, and generosity of everyone who supported these two twin projects of mine in the past year. Um, I appreciate it a great deal. Thank you. And it's, um, it's 10 past one exactly on the morning of the 21st of December. I hope to post this uh, video later today, uh, along with a short story, which I've written and been scribbling doodles for all day. Uh, it's something of a tra tradition that I've created over the past three years, uh, tradition or a rod for my own back. One of the two. Today it's felt like a rod for my own back, but anyway, <laughs> I'm doing it. So Merry Christmas and uh, all the very best for 2024. Cooking programs and fine dining seem to be all the rage that year in Britain. Villages the length and breadth of the country had become obsessed with gourmet food, cooking and preparing it in unexpected, weird and occasionally edible ways. Summer Penworthy, a village in the heart of England, was no exception to this fashion sweeping the country, and its inhabitants are a competitive bunch of people who pride themselves on their culinary skills. True, it is mostly of a steak and dale pie or steak and kidney pudding variety. But when a well-known fine diner, bon viveur, and acclaimed author of several cookery books, I refer, of course, to Roquefort Blenkinsop Fife, took up residence in the village, there was considerable excitement. He dined at the local pub one Saturday afternoon, and everyone was agog to see what the acerbic food critic, celebrity, and all-round know-it-all, who was known for his witty put-downs, would make of Mavis Hibbert's lunchtime fare. It was not favourable. He polished it off, though, wiped his mouth with an extravagant handkerchief, and then, with considerable distaste, and to the delight of those assembled, he pronounced it succinctly and with emphasis to be muck. This was in Mavis's hearing, and although his pronouncement was greeted with amusement by the multitude, Mavis was not amongst their number. "'Why did you eat it, then?' she demanded, glaring at Mr. Blenkinsop Fife. "'Dear lady,' he replied, with what can only be described as snooty insouciance, "'I always give everything a chance. It's a rule of mine. I eat anything once, even muck. And this muck will definitely only be consumed once by anyone of discernment. Mavis cleared the plates with more grace than she felt Mr. Blenkinsop Fife deserved, inquiring shortly, Will you be wanting any pudding? Oh, dear God, no, replied the elegant Mr. Blenkinsop Fife with a short, nasty laugh. One of your dishes is quite sufficient. This was greeted by a good deal of chortling, and occasional hooting amongst the watchers. It may have been this episode that persuaded the village to hold a fine dining competition of its own. Master Cook, he called it. It seemed a good idea, while they had the benefit of the food celebrity in their midst, to take some advantage of it. The village council decided to hold a round of heats open to all in the precincts of St. Egwin's Parish, and from these select four finalists, who would then cook for the three judges. Naturally, Mr. Blenkinsop Fife was asked to chair the judging panel. Lady Willoughby Price would also sit on it, and Mrs. Prothero, a large and wholesome lady of the village, wife of the chief constable of the county, would also be invited to judge. All three agreed with enthusiasm to do so. There was little doubt, of course, whose palate had chiefly to be assuaged. "'I shall give no quarter, I assure you,' warned Mr. Fife, sporting a red-spotted cravat and navy blue blazer, when the announcement of the Master Cook contest was made in the dog and whistle one Sunday after church service. He informed them, "'Mark me when I say I will be scoring highly 
or the most innovative cooks. What if he doesn't like it? He's very rude, said one woman. Mr. Fife overheard this and said, I will give everything a try, however vile it may be, and make no mistake, I'll say so if it is, but I want to see what you can do. Surprise me. It was a source of pride to Mr. Fife that he would eat, and had in fact eaten, some of the most revolting and inedible foods ever devised. Kangaroo Wellington was amongst his favourites, Crocodile Fondue another, and his carnivorous special assortment, which boasted no less than three endangered species of animal in the same dish, is well known to most people. He revelled in the publicity such things brought him. What an opinionated twerp, said Bert Hibbert, who was loafing against a wall, his hands in his pockets, watching the proceedings. He was probably still smarting at the offence given by Mr. Fife to his sister Mavis, the dog and whistle's esteemed cook. He'll turn his nose up at our food. Nonsense, said Mr. Fife, who was sharp of hearing. I'll eat anything once. It's my motto. Everything except large, unmentionable rodents. Here he glanced round at the perimeter of the room, where he thought he had spotted a rat bait box. Bert Hibbert was unimpressed. He kicked idly at a cigarette butt he had just dropped on the floor, noticing in doing so that his shoelace was undone, and considered momentarily whether he could be bothered to do it up, or just leave it as it was. His idle nature decided the matter for him. All this fine dining is rubbish. You don't actually like the food, he informed Mr. Fife at last. An argument developed between the men, and Bert Hibbert said he was half-minded to knock the socks off Mr. Fife by entering the competition himself and showing him local nosh at its best. But Mr. Fife just laughed at him, and Bert went off muttering to himself his idle shoelace whipping around his ankles annoyingly. "'You've met your match, Bert,' one local laughed. Mr. Fife was pleased to have triumphed so publicly over one of the native yokels. "'We'll see,' said Bert over his shoulder. "'Anyone else want to take me on?' said Mr. Fife good-humouredly. "'Mind you, I'm taking no prisoners today,' he assured the delighted crowd. You showed Bert Hibbert, Mr. Fifey, some admirer called out. Fife smiled. He did, didn't he? But the next day, Bert let it be known in the village that he would be entering the competition, and they should watch and see. He was going to cook some of the most gourmet meals the village had ever seen, he said. He would make this Fife eat his words. I expect he won't eat your grub, Bert, some wit opined. Bert just said, you wait and see. Bert told people he had set about honing his cooking skills and had even borrowed a cookbook from the library, or at least his winsome lad, Bully, did so for him, though it is unknown whether he actually went so far as to open it. When questioned about it, he would only say, it's all a load of hooey. Most of the stuff that five chap, or whatever his name is, eats is inedible. He just won't admit it. You're an ignoramus, said Fife, when he was informed of this in the pub in Bert's presence. Bert looked at him uncertainly. Ignoramus, is that one of your poor endangered animals you eat? he asked. Roquefort Blenkinsop Fife guffawed in a way which was not at all flattering to Bert Hibbert and surveyed him with easy contempt. You just all talk, said Bert at a loss for something to say, downed his drink and walked off. Round two to me, I think, said Mr. Fife to the grinning bystanders. Even those who had no interest in cookery found it pleasant to see Bert Hibbert bested so publicly in this way. When the day of the cookery heats competition came, sure enough, Bert Hibbert was there. For the heats, members of the village committee were to judge the food, the top team of judges, which included Fife, would judge the final competition. The vicar of St. Edwin's, the Reverend Simmons, was in charge of proceedings, and there was an excellent turnout for the occasion at the village hall. 
But as it turned out, it was an event which caused some ill feeling in the village. There were seventeen contestants who proudly presented their wares to the committee judges. Amongst the local favourites entered were Mrs. Craddock, the Women's Institute Village Bakery Champion, three years running, Mrs. Bywater, the local school domestic science teacher, and Mrs. Simmons, the vicar's wife, whose scones and hot cross buns were always regarded with much enthusiasm at village events. A less familiar figure, and a somewhat surprising entry to most, was Mr. Bertrand Hibbert, whose skills in the art of cookery had never hitherto been tested to anyone's knowledge. An idle sort of man, who kept chickens and loafed around the dog and whistle the rest of the time, it was difficult to see him possessing any of the skill sets required for success in the master cook competition. Yet in this preliminary round, he boldly, outrageously, said some, entered his name as a contestant. He was in confident mood, too. It seemed exceedingly doubtful, amusing even, that he had the temerity to suppose he had a cat in hell's chance of winning. But his misplaced confidence simply served to enhance the village's amusement. He wouldn't get anywhere, of course, and his entry was remarked upon as being something of a comical sideshow amongst the more serious contestants. But of the seventeen entries to the competition, Bert Hibbert astonished all challengers, indeed the entire community, by emerging as one of the four finalists selected to cook for the esteemed judges on Sunday the 23rd of August. Now it should be said that the matter did not go unchallenged by other contestants, and there was much bad feeling when Bert, who did not appear to know how to light the oven even, produced an astonishingly presentable four-course meal which was described as being of outstanding merit. But when it was learned that his eldest child, the lively and popular boy named Bully, had been lurking in the grounds of Lady Willoughby Price's residence earlier that evening, and that her ladyship's chef complained that the meal he had prepared for his employer and her guests had gone missing from the kitchen. Well, it can easily be seen how people might be tempted to jump to the wrong conclusion. But as the vicar pointed out, some of the accusations made were unsubstantiated and quite out of keeping with the good-natured spirit of the contest, and in any case there was nothing to be done about it. Bert Hibbert was one of the four finalists selected for the Master Cook Summer Penworthy contest. It was inevitable, perhaps, that the community, which had little love for Bert Hibbert and his family, regarding them as petty, dishonest folk, should close ranks against him, and they put measures in place to ensure that there could be no opportunity of any further skullduggery in the final itself. Indeed, it was, as the day of the competition approached, noted with some satisfaction that Bert Hibbert did not appear to be able to make scrambled eggs on toast without some minor catastrophe intervening, including, on one occasion, the fire brigade turning up at his house. Although Bert explained hurriedly that it was flame-grilled burgers he was aiming for, and this was his third attempt at them, the villagers openly mocked him. They drew a certain grim satisfaction from knowing that the competition to which, in their view, he had diddled his way, would be witness to his profound humiliation. That fifey bloke will show him, said one. Ah, that's for sure, said another. He has the measure of Bert Hibbert already. Are you going to the final? inquired the first. Wouldn't miss it for the world, replied his companion. Bert Hibbert will never show his face in the village again when Fifey is done with him. For the competition, the three judges would be served with a four-course meal by each of the four contestants. They would discuss and individually score each of these in turn, at the end of which the winner would be announced by the Reverend Simmons. The arrival of the judges was greeted with considerable excitement by the assembled crowd, and a huge banner proclaiming the Midsummer Penworthy Master Cook competition was draped across the entrance to the village hall for the occasion. Most eyes were on Rockefeller Blinkinsop Fife. He was the man to watch, all agreed. 
and there was an excited anticipation to learn with what withering comments he would demolish Bert Hibbert's dishes. Of course, Fife was a man known for his willingness to try the most exotic combinations. His Badger Delight and Lescargo a la Mode were award-winning dishes. It was often said of him there were few things he wouldn't try. In fact, he boasted of it, except, of course, any form of unmentionable large rodent. That went without saying. He had a lifelong horror of such creatures. But it was obvious to all that Bert Hibbert had no means of exciting such a sophisticated palate. And Fife was already in an irritable mood, because the committee had misspelled his name with a capital F on the banner, rather than the dignified double lowercase f, which is, of course, the correct spelling, and had been, as he pointed out, since his ancestors brought their pedigree of fine dining acumen across the channel sometime around 1066. However, he set this aside, and in a brief speech to the contestants and for the reporter of the Summer Penworthy Chronicle, Fife said the judges looked forward to the offerings of the contestants and would be rewarding innovation in particular, and people who were willing to push the boundaries. We don't want to see people turning out the same old stuff, he informed them. Too long has Britain lagged behind our continental rivals in the sphere of foodery. Challenge us! Challenge our taste buds. We want to see a new spin on old dishes. This short speech was received with enthusiasm and applause by the audience gathered and packed tightly into the village hall. Bert Hibbert looked satisfied on hearing this. He nodded to himself sagely throughout. Others whispered and snickered. The Reverend Simmons, beaming to see his parishioners about the Lord's work in this spirited competition, put the competitors under starter's orders, and the competition began. Course one came with high expectations. It was the starter, and those assembled in the hall sniffed the air in eager anticipation as the first contestant appeared from the kitchen area. Mrs. Jameson's egg on toast with a garnish of parsley and a knob of butter was regarded as a worthy effort, but perhaps not sufficiently exciting or adventurous enough to score highly in this round. The same could not be said, however, of Bert Hibbert's first effort. His soup, consommé à la Française l'enfant, was regarded as something rather unpleasant by the judges. What is it? demanded Fife, with obvious distaste. It's my own dish, said Bert proudly. It's got those scargos you like in it. Mr. Fife gave a little snort of derision at this. I hardly imagine your scargos, as you call them, will be suitable for my palate, he said. Well, you won't know if you just play with it, Bert retorted. Fife ran his spoon through the gloopy, somewhat slimy consistency of Bert's starter. He said the consistency was thick, and he preferred something lighter as an appetizer. Bert Hibbert was undeterred by this initial criticism. The proof of the pudding is in the eating, he said doggedly. The three judges regarded their soup dubiously. Of course, they were loath to admit any squeamishness on their part over the dish, and Fife was known to regard squeamishness as being the province of ordinary folk without discerning educated palates, something he prided himself on being in the possession of. Mrs. Prothero and Lady Willoughby Price pulled extraordinary faces at the smallest sips of consommé à la Française l'enfant. They felt themselves unwilling to go further than this. But Fife, who considered his professional reputation to be at stake, as well as being unwilling to allow Bert Hibbert to claim any public advantage over him, scooped up a moderate-sized spoonful of the offending consommé and tasted it. Mrs. Prothero pointed out two oblong delicacies of some unknown origin which she discerned in the bowl and which caused considerable excitement and some comment amongst the spectators. But Fife, who was not wholly attentive at the time, took a further spoonful of the consommé Francais l'enfant and partook of one of the oblong delicacies, which, as it turned out, 
were not Lescargo at all. These are not Lescargo, expostulated a red-faced and clearly discomfited Mr. Rockerpaw of Blenkinsop Fife. These are slugs, he roared. My mistake, said Bert coolly. The two women judges rounded on Bert in horror swilling out their mouths copiously with water and taking up some wine hastily, making expressions of profound disgust. "'How revolting!' exclaimed Lady Willoughby Price. A lively murmur went round the room. "'They were on the kitchen floor this morning, snuck in under the back door,' Bert informed them. "'That'll be the rain last night did that,' Fife scowled. But, unwilling to yield to Bert's sly watchfulness, maintained a stoical, red-faced silence, and then, with great self-control, pronounced the taste of the consommé as bitter, and its consistency unsatisfactorily slippery in texture. "'That'll be the frog's born, said Bert, nodding. Mrs. Prothero looked like she would vomit. "'Frog's born, said Fife, half-choking trying to keep his composure, although he looked fit to explode. "'That's the different spin you wanted, see?' said Bert, confidentially. "'The Francais l'enfant. It means baby frogs, see? "'And the scargos,' he reminded him, smiling winningly. "'Slugs are not bloody scargos!' exclaimed Fife, momentarily losing his composure. The crowded hall thrilled to the spectacle and shrank back, as the offending plates, held at arm's length by the volunteer plate collector, were ordered removed from the room. It was a lively scene. The audience was joyfully filled with horrified mutterings. Bert Hibbert stood nonchalantly and turned to the audience, saying, by way of an aside, in a loud stage whisper, I think I won that one with my l'enfant français. He certainly seemed pleased with himself and was presumably oblivious, or at least pretended not to hear Ted Longbottom say what everyone else in the room was thinking. He's given them slugs and frog spawn soup. That's what he's gone and done. The judge's spirit seemed a little less effusive as the first round came to a close. The second course began with Mrs. James's quail in egg sauce. It was well received. It may be that after the contretemps of the first course and the slugs, or suspected slugs, because Bert Hibbert insisted they were similar to what he called the scargos much favoured in French cuisine, that expectations had lowered. There was, however, a certain note of apprehension when Bert Hibbert announced his next dish. But Fife was determined to get back on top. He was not going to be bested by this local ignoramus in front of all the village who had turned out to see him triumph. Toad in the hole, announced Bert. Well, when it was announced, Fife's humour was thoroughly restored. He could not contain a guffaw. Now, as almost all British people will know, Toad in the hole is a somewhat plain meal consisting of sausage in battered Yorkshire pudding. This is hardly the stuff of gourmet dining, the author of the popular cookery book, Surprising Cuisine, exclaimed scornfully. There was some amusement at this amongst the watchers, too. They grinned at each other. Mr. Fife was back on top. This was what they wanted to say. However, they and Mr. Fife were mistaken. When the meal was brought before him, and Mr. Hibbert announced again, Toad in the hole, with a slow emphasis. There was a degree of surprise and dismay that on a plate of flat Yorkshire pudding sat what appeared to be, indeed was, an actual toad. In its favour, though, it was clearly deceased and at least partially cooked. But this was, to put it mildly, somewhat unexpected. Of course, gourmet diners are adventurous people, they do not consider themselves to be timid in their tastes, nor in their willingness to try new foods. But there are limits. In short, the judges did not like to object to this adventurous dish with which they were presented by Mr. Hibbert. Toad in the hole, murmured Fife, surveying the plate with extreme caution. 
Toad in the hole, confirmed Bert Hibbert agreeably. I found it on the patio dead this morning. That's when the idea came to me. It must be said that a hush had fallen over the village hall at the ghastliness of the spectacle they were witnessing. One or two people stuffed handkerchiefs into their mouths. Someone bit the sleeve of their pullover. Two of the judges tried a small, very small, mouthful of the battered pudding, as distant from the late toad as possible. But to the credit of Mr. Five, he girded himself and attempted to partake of a very small sample of the toad. But the expression on his face, the beads of perspiration on his brow, and the way in which he gagged twice, then quickly reached for his glass of wine and quaffed it off in great gulps, told its tale. Bert Hibbert, watching him closely, did not seem at all dismayed by this. The famed cookery personality and bon viveur, having recovered and wiping his mouth on the back of his hand, said simply that he thought the dish lacked flavours, was not sufficiently seasoned, and needed work. No one dared say more, although someone in the crowd was heard to remark, I wouldn't eat that for a thousand pounds, which received much agreement from those around them. I wonder what it died of, said another. There was a stir of interested speculation at this. I know, called out Bully Hibbert, helpfully. Quiet boy, said his father quickly. After this, a certain hush had fallen over the room. There was a somberness at the table at which the judges sat too. A quiet, dreadful apprehension. It left all wondering what Hibbert's main course would be. They didn't have long to find out. He entered with a large casserole dish and placed it on the table before them. Ratatouille, he announced with some pride and a certain gleam in his eye, which was missed by no one. The three judges looked at the dish apprehensively. There was a long silence. Ratatouille, you say? asked Fife slowly. Yes, sir, confirmed Mr. Hibbert. He looked at Bert Hibbert quietly for a few moments, and then his gaze returned uncertainly to the dish. It looked well cooked. The other two judges looked at it with the gravest suspicion. Ratatouille, eh? Fife said, half to himself this time, still considering the dish before him. His companions looked distinctly unenthusiastic. All attention was on the casserole dish before them, Bert began to serve up onto their plates, while they watched with fixed gazes of doubtful expressions. Around the room there was a great deal of whispering and a certain expression of looming horror. Someone was watching the proceedings through fingers covering both their eyes. Others had placed their hands over their mouths. What are the, the, uh, the ingredients in this dish? inquired Mr. Fife, author of Surprise your friends with your food. The usual, said Bert Hibbert, as he put the first plate down in front of Lady Willoughby Price, who shrank from it visibly. Yes, but what I mean is, what exactly are the ingredients you have used in this? persisted Mr. Five. Bert considered. Tomato sauce base, aubergine, onion, peppers, the green and red ones, not the yellow ones, garnished with oregano, bay leaf and rosemary, he said, thinking it through carefully to himself. Oh, said Mr. Fife, a certain relief betraying him. I say, a traditional vegetarian ratatouille. Bert Hibbert's eyes clouded over for a moment. His brows lowered as he thought carefully. The hall watched him. Not exactly, he said at last. The celebrity judge looked at him sharply. What do you mean? he asked. Is this Ratatouille vegetarian? Mostly, said Bert, considering the matter carefully. Is there meat in there? demanded Mr. Fife. Oh, yes, sir, Bert assured him. The judge, who was clearly showing great interest in the ingredients forming Bert's main dish, 
and was a man of some precision in details, was quickly upon this. What meat? he inquired, alternating his intense gaze between the ratatouille and the chef. The room was hushed to absolute silence. Everyone looked at Bert. He was thinking. Bert thought about it for what seemed to those listeners a long time before saying at last, Lamb. The relaxation in the room was palpable. There was a collective sigh of relief throughout the hall. Lamb, exclaimed Mr. Fife. Well, what are we waiting for? Tuck in. The judge had a forkful of ratatouille in his mouth when Bert, still thoughtful, he was a slow thinker, added, and some meat, mostly off the hind quarters of a rat. I say the food was in the judge's mouth, and although I am confident in this assertion, it was of such a transitory nature that it might be the subject of dispute by a skilful lawyer, because before it got as far as Mr. Fife's tonsils, it had been ejected with considerable force from the judge's mouth, travelling an impressive distance across the room. I have no idea what the world record is for the forceful expulsion of ratatouille from a person's mouth across a room, but it is entirely possible that it was exceeded on this occasion by Mr. Rockefeller Blenkinsop Fife. There was such a shriek, not only from Judge Fife, author of Gastronomic Surprises, who seemed very much surprised, but his two companions at the table also, the sounds of scraping of chairs, and Mr. Fife running to the corner of the room, scraping his tongue desperately with his fingers, and retching violently into a fire bucket he discovered there, that it is uncertain whether or not he heard Bert's continued explanation as to the rats being sourced from a gin trap he had loaded in the corner of the hay barn the night before, and found this morning he had got lucky. Whether he did or did not hear this informative additional detail regarding the source of the meat he had sampled, we cannot know, nor does it seem that he was reassured by Bert's assertion that the sustainability of the meat was viable, as his barn was alive with rats. What is certain is that when he had recovered to a degree, and amidst much coughing, spluttering, and spitting constantly, the language he directed at Bert Hibbert was deeply shocking. I am, of course, unable to repeat any of this, but it was accorded by all present to be quite disgraceful. In the Church Hall of St. Edwin's, too. Bert said he had never heard such language, and it was lucky the vicar was not in the room at the time to hear it. It just goes to show, he said later, you can't tell a person by how they dress or speak or because they've written fancy gourmet books. Sometimes those who pretend to be the best are the worst, and the other way about, too. Who could argue with him? Certainly not the vicar, who, on re-entering the church hall, was utterly confounded to discover the celebrity judge conducting himself with what can only be described as the illest of graces. The police were inevitably called in after a threat of physical violence was made by the elegant Mr. Fife towards Bert Hibbert. Alfie Robottom, the local police constable, turned up and restored order in a short time, suggesting to the esteemed food critic that he remove himself from the hall and restrain his language, or he would find it necessary to take him in charge for public order offences. Colonel Prothero, Chief Constable, who, on learning from his wife of the ghastly experience the judges had suffered, took a different view, and was distinctly irritated by P.C. Robottom's lecture to his wife on conducting herself properly in a public place. He scowled at his subordinates as he sought to comfort his wife. His spirits, though, lifted somewhat when he noticed Alfie sitting at the table with a bowl of soup. I'll tell you what, sir, this scargo l'enfance is tasty, he declared. The colonel laughed unpleasantly. Tuck in, he said. I think you'll find there's some toad in the hole going spare, too. There was consternation in the hall and some debate as to what should happen to the summer Penworthy Mastercook competition. The fourth dish had not been served. There were some who wished it to be abandoned entirely. 
some who wished to merely postpone it. But in the end, in the interests of fairness, the Reverend Simmons decided, with some reluctance and much opposition, that the only thing that could be done was to present the prize of gourmet master cook of Summer Penworthy to the only person who had completed three rounds of the meal. That was Bert Hibbert, of course. There were few people who remained in the hall to witness the presentation of the gourmet's cup, the first prize of one hundred pounds, and title of Master Cook of Summer Penworthy of the Year, to Bert Hibbert. Those who remained did not applaud his success, and there was a general air of dissatisfaction hanging over the hall, along with the lingering smell of Bert's consommé l'enfant. Bert had his photograph taken, and it appeared on the front page of the Summer Penworthy Chronicle the following week, together with an interview in which he expounded on the principles of fine dining at some length, and spoke of his intention of writing a book on the subject of his favourite recipes. People were generally put off the notion of fine dining after this in Summer Penworthy. It's all very well, gourmet eating, said one, but you have to enjoy it too. Others agreed, including Bert Hibbert. All this fine dining is overrated, he declared, just like I said in the first place. And who could argue with him? He was, after all, the master cook of Summer Penworthy.